violence, civil war, genocide. Uh, it would be the most extreme kind of suffering, and it would be a betrayal of our own values. It would be a betrayal of what it is that we most value about uh, Britain, about Germany, about uh, liberal democracy. Hello, I'm Alex Kruger, and you're listening to World Review from the New Statesman, a twice-weekly international news podcast. In this episode, I'm speaking to Yasha Monk, a writer and academic who specializes in the study of populism. His new book is called The Great Experiment, How to Make Diverse Democracies Work. First of all, Yasha, why, why the great experiment? What's at stake? What is the experiment? Um, so I think that we're actually in a historically unique situation right now. There's been lots of diverse societies in the history of the world, but most of them have suffered from deep injustices. There's been democracies for a long time, but most of them have either been relatively homogeneous, as the United Kingdom has been in the past, or deeply unjust, as the United States has been since its founding with slavery and other forms of uh, domination. So what we're trying to do right now is to build diverse democracies that actually treat their citizens of whatever ethnicity, of whatever religion, as true equals. Uh, and we don't have a historical precedent for that. So it's very hard to make work. Uh, I'm trying to explain why that's so difficult in my book, but I'm also trying to paint an optimistic vision for why I'm actually uh, more upbeat, more optimistic about our chances of success than many people today on the right, but also on the left. And you identify three forms of, of problems, um, structured anarchy, fragmentation, and... Domination. Domination, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Um, what are they briefly, and can you explain? Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things that strikes me about the current discourse about where we're at is that we sometimes have this tendency to say, my God, you know, why are things so terrible today? Why are there these injustices in our society today? Um, but without looking at what's going wrong in, in other countries and what's gone wrong in the past. And so for me, the starting point was to say, all right, let's actually think about how diverse societies have usually worked, or certainly more to the point, how they haven't worked, what the pitfalls were from which they, into which they fell. And so the three most important are structured anarchy, as you're saying. Um, so Thomas Hobbes worried that without an effective state, there would be a war of all against all, these sort of atomized individuals. That's not actually what we see. What we see is that in some places where there's real uh, deep conflicts between different uh, ethnic groups, religions, clans, tribes, uh, and you don't get an effective state, uh, you end up with uh, quite a lot of norms governing the behavior of the members of particular small groups, but an inability to collaborate in order to sustain public goods, schools, hospitals, roads, all of the basic things we need to, to have a decent life. The solution to that sometimes has been domination. Um, so the ascendancy of one group over the others. That can help to solve the problems of structured anarchy uh, because you can actually sustain a relatively effective state when one group is in charge. But of course, it comes at the unacceptable expense of the suffering of a dominated group. Um, and that's what we've seen in its hard form with slavery in the United States, uh, with legal systems that explicitly made one group or one caste dominant and subjugated the others. But we've also had soft forms of domination in which uh, the rules were seemingly neutral, but in reality, uh, people who didn't belong to the native group or to the majority group uh, were not treated fairly. And then finally, we see the problem of fragmentation where uh, different rival groups strike a kind of deal in which they say, you know, some of the most important decisions are devolved to the level of each group. Uh, we don't think of a state as a collection of individuals, but as an association of association, in the words of one British political theorist. Uh, and that can keep the peace. Uh, well, that's been tried in places like Lebanon. Political scientists have celebrated that as a solution to diverse societies. Uh, but normally it has postponed rather than averted the outbreak of civil war, and it has deeply undermined our democratic agency um, because all of our over the lives of these citizens was then determined by the group they were in. They had limited control over the laws governing marriage, divorce, education, and so on, which were often set by religious authority. Um, and all of these three dangers, structured anarchy, domination, and fragmentation, in one form or another, I, I think remain life dangers 
for how the great experiment that we're engaged in today in the United Kingdom and in other countries uh, could go off the rails. And diversity is often touted as a, a wonderful thing. It's a benefit that, you know, more diverse societies, more diverse groups of people combine ideas better. So it, it seems slightly counterintuitive that they are subject to these pressures. Yes. Um, unfortunately, uh, when you look at, at history, there's been wonderful moments in which uh, deeply diverse societies have thrived and succeeded. There's also obviously been uh, injustice, murder, uh, genocide uh, on a massive scale uh, again and again. So the stakes for the success of a great experiment are high. I would go one step further than that, which is that I started reflecting as a scholar of democracy, how democratic institutions intersect with that. And there's bad news here, but there's also potentially good news. The bad news is that democratic institutions often inflame the tensions between different groups. When you think of the most celebrated examples of multi-ethnic societies, of diverse societies that have worked well, they were often empires. You might think of the Vienna of the 19th century or the Constantinople uh, of of the 13th century, the the Istanbul of the 17th century, uh, Baghdad um, in, in the Middle Ages. Well, those were all some form of empire ruled by a monarch. And one of the reasons for that is that if I don't have any political power anyway, and you don't have any political power, then I'm not particularly worried if your group grows and mine doesn't, because we both depend on the goodwill of the monarch, and if we trust the monarch, then I don't have to worry too much about immigration, about demographic change. A democracy is always essentially about uh, building majorities, right? Part of democracy is collective self-determination, And so whether or not uh, I get to determine what the rules are can depend in part on whether my group is the biggest one. And so if I suddenly see that because of immigration or other forms of demographic change, other groups are uh, outpacing me, are becoming bigger than my group, well, that's where you get all of the fears that are so present today, especially on the right of the political spectrum about the Great Replacement, about the United States supposedly becoming a majority-minority country as uh, one Uh, later senior advisor in Donald Trump's White House put it in a 2016 uh, essay that was very influential among American conservatives in making the case for building, uh, for voting for Donald Trump, the quote-unquote ceaseless importation of third world foreigners, which was supposedly making it impossible for us to govern ourselves democratically. So democratic institutions can inflame those fears. Um, uh, And so that's actually an additional difficulty in building not just diverse societies, but diverse democracies. You use this wonderful phrase in the book, conflict entrepreneurs. There is a sense in which some people are really profiting from these divisions and, and building a career on them. And you, you mentioned Donald Trump. How, how can diverse democracies um, confront this and, and, and push back against it and, and not kind of give too much ground and say, yeah, we, we shouldn't have been diverse in the first place. It was a really bad idea. We'll try and pretend we're all the same because you lot are all the same. You're united. Therefore, we have to fight you on your own ground. Yeah, so I think there's, 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 there's two steps to this. The first is to uh, counter explicitly the theory of the Great Replacement. So part of the story or the title of my book, The Great Experiment, is that I did an interview with sort of the biggest German news show, Tagesthemen, in which you used this phrase, phrase, the Great Experiment, just in the moment. And it was actually appropriated uh, by, uh, you know, conspiracy theorists on the far right, that there is this Harvard academic, uh, I was at Harvard at the time, uh, admitting that he and Angela Merkel are experimenting on the German people, right? Now, finally, the cat is out of the bag. Um, uh, and so they thought that experiment meant sort of, uh, you know, we're in a chemistry lab and I know exactly what the outcome is and we're just sort of, you know, experimenting on the German people or on other democratic people, you know, for fun. What I mean by experiment, of course, is that, uh, you know, we have come without really meaning to, without much foresight, without recognizing that that's the outcome of the political decisions we've taken over the last decades, uh, to, to be in an unprecedented situation. This is the kind of great experiment that the founding fathers of the United States engaged in uh, when, when we founded an American republic at a time when self-governing republics had been incredibly rare in history and had mostly failed in history. And so that's the kind of experiment we're in. But, but, but that means that we need to actually counter the narrative of the far right, which is, number one, that 
we are here because of a deliberate choice uh, or even a conspiracy of political and other elites who want to replace the current population of countries like the United Kingdom. Number two, that uh, the reason why the United Kingdom or Germany or the United States have historically been strong, successful countries is the ethnic and cultural makeup um, and that supposedly the people who have arrived in our countries who are arriving in our countries are inferior on cultural, perhaps even biological grounds, and that therefore uh, their immigration is necessarily leading uh, to disaster. And thirdly, that the upshot is supposed to be that we abandon the great experiment. We abandon uh, uh, the attempt to build equal um, diverse societies um, in order to sort of turn back the clock and re-homogenize them. Uh, each count of this is wrong, and it's wrong in ways that I think the fact that we're now very diverse is a result of political choices they were made for other reasons. Um, in Germany, it is mostly a result of the Wirtschaftswunder, of the economic miracle of the 1950s and the 1960s, the need for unskilled labor in, uh, in German factories at that time. There was a labor shortage, and so the government went around uh, inviting people in who were supposed to be guest workers, supposed to go back home after a few years. That, of course, didn't happen. So Germany is not a diverse society because Konrad Adenauer, the conservative chancellor of the post-war period, wanted to replace the German population. It's a diverse society because of economic needs and the policies that were pursued in order to meet them. You could make a similar argument about the United Kingdom and empire, right? The reason why Britain is a diverse society today is in a large part the result of the creation and the dissolution of empire. And that certainly was pursued in the interests of uh, you know, British power and British wealth, not in the interests of uh, changing the makeup of a British population. So that's point number one. Point number two is to counter the argument that uh, the integration of immigrants or the integration of ethnic and religious minorities is going so badly that it will uh, destroy the wealth or the well-being of our countries. Um, and so I've spent a good amount of time in this book uh, actually looking into the details of uh, social and economic mobility over time, of uh, language acquisition, uh, of uh, uh, loyalty to democratic values, all of the things that the right say is lacking in immigrants. And, and actually, um, uh, the research there is, is much more upbeat than many people on the right, and by the way, some people on the left as well, uh, believe, uh, which is to say that actually... Uh, in the United States, for example, the rate at which uh, immigrants from Central and Southern America are making economic progress, are making educational progress, is about the same as it was for Italian Americans and Irish Americans uh, a century ago. Uh, in Europe, including in the United Kingdom, there is, of course, a socioeconomic gap, which should not be surprising when you have people immigrating who come from countries with lower socioeconomic development, with much less opportunity to go to school to develop their skills, and um, often that remains the case for the lifetime of an immigrant, but their children are actually more likely to succeed than the children of similarly positioned uh, uh, British residents. And the grandchildren are going to do even better. And so there is a real socioeconomic mobility across the generations, which means that according to some of the best research, we're actually headed uh, for equality over time. And then the third point, very quickly, um, is a rejection of a solution that theorists of a great replacement uh, would like to pose. They say, uh, this has been imposed on us, uh, it's going to end in disaster, so let's abandon it. Uh, well, it hasn't been imposed, I don't think it needs to end in disaster, but thirdly, what it would mean to abandon it, uh, and this is something that's become very vivid to me by looking at all the history of diverse societies, is violence, civil war, genocide, uh, it would be the most extreme kind of suffering, and it would be a betrayal of our own values. It would be a betrayal of what it is that we most value about uh, Britain, about Germany, about uh, liberal democracy. I think that was one of the things that struck me the most was how optimistic you were, because these are these are difficult times. They are turbulent. They're very polarized, and you know you've you've written in a, in a in a very measured way not not sort of cheerleaderish but you you really are being optimistic at a time when that goes against the grain and this is where you know look i come from the left and in many ways this is a, a book which uh champions uh the need to make ethnically and religiously diverse societies work so i think it speaks very much 
to the left-wing values with which I was raised and, and, and which I continue to hold. But this is the point where I think the book may be in conflict with some of your listeners, which is that there is a tendency among us to catastrophize. There's a tendency to look at all the injustices, to look at what's worst about our societies. And that often comes from a very understandable place. It's because we want to improve our society. It's because we want to make progress. And in order to do that, the natural things, to point at the bad things, say, look at how bad that is. Let's master the moral outrage in order to improve it. And so in many contexts, that can be healthy. But I think when it comes to a question like, can we make these diverse societies and these diverse democracies work and succeed? Can we convince our fellow citizens of the importance of that? We really need to actually be able to offer a positive vision. We really need to actually be able to offer a vision of a future that most people would want to live in. And if uh, the way we talk, for example, about inequality ends up sounding eerily similar to that of the far right, where we might have different causal explanations. We say it's all about racism and discrimination, why you know every non-white Briton is worse off than all the white Britons. But substantively, we say the same thing as the far right, which is, you know, these people are just less wealthy and contribute less to, to, to the economy and are less educated. Um, we might think about whose political a theory of, of who profits by emphasizing this actually is uh, closer to the mark. And I fear that the far right may be, may, may be correct, that if you keep emphasizing the wrong facts uh, about how there's no progress for immigrants or, or, or ethnic minorities, how they will forever be in some kind of subordinate position, how they will never contribute to the economy in the same way, that's not going to... Uh, uh, rouse political action on the left that is going to drive people to the cynicism and the pessimism uh, of the far right. So let's look at the facts as they actually are. They include plenty of injustices and plenty of problems that we have to be upfront about, uh, but they also include real progress compared to what our society looked like 50 or 25 years ago, and they should give us the building blocks for political vision uh, based in the core values uh, of our political system, uh, which uh, can be inspiring, which can actually convince people that it is worth trying as best we can to make this great experiment work. Which countries do you think have made the most progress on this? Not necessarily are the furthest ahead, but have come from, you know, c comparative progress. They, were, they, were, they started from far back and and have done a lot in germany i think the, the the conception of national identity has changed quite a bit in the past 20 30 years is that fair to say yeah you know i was trying to avoid giving germany as an answer because i grew up in germany and i'm you know i my 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 my, my instinct is always to be skeptical about the country and i think people often have too rosy a view of germany from the outside um, but it is true, for example, at the moment that of all the different countries uh, in which populism is a threat to, to, to the political system, um, and I would include Germany among that, I would include just about every democracy in the world among that, Germany seems to be least threatened, as we saw in the last elections, in which actually uh, the ghastly far-right uh, alternative for Deutschland declined in their share of the vote. It's down to about 10%, which is too much, uh, but which is much better than what uh, you know, uh, the far right uh, uh, receives in presidential elections in France um, and, and is arguably less influential in public discourse uh, than the uh, far right element of, of British media and politics. And certainly that's true for self-conception as well. I mean, when I uh, was growing up in Germany, the refrain of all politicians was Germany is not a country of immigration, uh, which simply uh, was a lie because the country was already... Um, deeply marked by immigration. But that has changed. Germany has recognized that, as a matter of fact, it has become a country of immigration. And it's, it's done pretty well at integrating uh, newcomers despite its denial. But I guess I would say in general uh, that each country has its own historical problems and how to approach a diverse democracy. Some of those are shared. Some of those are locally specific. But in every country, there's been big progress. I mean, the United States... Um, which has, you know, in many ways the most complicated history on this. Um, you know, when I was born, a majority of Americans believed that interracial marriage was a bad thing, that people should not marry across the boundaries of their ethnicity. 
today that view is in the single digits. Um, and it's actually, interestingly, <clears throat> more widely held among ethnic minorities than among white Americans. You know, when you look at representation of uh, Latinos, Asian Americans, African Americans in the top echelons of not just sports and entertainment, but business, politics, every realm of life, um, it has increased tremendously over the last decades. And, you know, I would say the same thing is true in the United Kingdom as well. Um, when I was in college in England, at uni in England, a couple of decades ago, the countries did still feel uh, very dominated uh, by one ethnic group and perhaps by one gender. I think when you look at even the composition of the Tory cabinet, that is no longer the case. Um, let alone when you look at media and uh, entertainment and business and all the other realms of, of, of British life. So again, I think we need to distinguish between the question of what is the current state of society, and there's certainly uh, progress to be made, and the question of what's our trajectory. And I think when you look in a dispassionate way at what Britain looked like 20, 40, 60 years ago and compared to today, um, it would take willful denial of the good aspects of our own society to recognize that we've made progress. And that should make us more optimistic and more determined to achieve more progress in the coming decades and to recognize that we can achieve that progress by living up to our own values and our own uh, standards uh, more fully than we have in the past, rather than by giving up on those values. One of the things that slightly surprised me was you you talked about um, various measures to redress justice, and there's, there seemed to be fairly wide support for uh, measures of redress on a class basis, but sometimes redress on a racial basis, affirmative action, got a much more negative response, including from some of the people who might conceivably be the beneficiaries. Did that surprise you? Well, it didn't entirely surprise me because it's such a, a, a vivid debate in the United States and there's been very good empirical evidence on this for a while. So we just had a referendum in California uh, which wanted to lift a ban on affirmative action for the state universities, which are very strong in, in California, University of Berkeley, UCLA, and so on. Um, uh, and this was a, a referendum which was supported by uh, the entire Californian political class by all of the corporations and newspapers, everybody endorsed it. Um, it had a funding advantage of over 10 to 1, uh, and it was clearly rejected uh, by, I think, 58% of, of a vote in a state that is majority minority, which is, say, in a state in which white voters are in the minority. And so the rejection uh, of this actually goes very strong. Now, I think affirmative action is one question. Um, but there are forms of what's now called race-conscious or race-sensitive public policy which go well beyond affirmative action. There have been attempts, for example, uh, to determine who is prioritized for the vaccine in the United States when it was sparse, uh, or who is uh, prioritized for life-saving treatments uh, for, for COVID um, when the first uh, uh, pills became available that actually are very effective at, at treating COVID if they're taken early. Uh, which were based uh, uh, to a very significant extent on the race of the patient. And I do think that there we're not just in territory that is very unpopular, which uh, is going to make a tremendous contribution to re-electing Donald Trump as president unless Democrats very clearly distance themselves uh, from it. Um, but I think we're also in a territory which is going to tear our society apart. You know, one of the things that I've discovered writing this book is just the strong psychological instinct people have to discriminate in favor of the in-group and against the out-group. Now, that is manageable because what the in-group is and what the out-group is is very malleable. I think it is perfectly possible to tell people one of your important uh, characteristics is that you're British. And when the Olympics comes around, you will uh, you know, fervently support athletes who may have a different skin color or a different religion from you because you're both British. But if all of the elite institutions in society say the most important thing about you is your skin color, the most important thing about you is your religion, at the age of eight or 10, you are placed in a group with other children of 
the same ethnic group or the same religious group by your teachers, not as a voluntary act by you or as a Sunday school by your parents, but by your teachers who split you up into those groups. Because that is the most fundamental thing about you. And by the way, when it comes to needing uh, sparse medical treatment, the thing that determines whether or not you receive it is going to be the color of your skin. That means that people are going to say, by far and away, the most important thing about me is my skin color, is my ethnicity. Um, and everything we know about human nature is that that's not going to make uh, white Americans, for example, say, uh, oh, let me be a good anti-racist and fight against the privilege I have. That is going to make them fight uh, for every advantage they have and feel threatened and, and lash out. And so uh, I'm not an opponent of every form of uh, race-conscious policy. It depends a lot on the context. For once, I think the Supreme Court of the United States has a sensible standard, which has been accepted by everybody from Ruth Bader Ginsburg to Antonin Scalia, which is basically that there should be a presumption against race-conscious policy, but that it can be pursued when it is in the compelling interest of a state and it is narrowly tailored. That seems like the right standard. Um, but there are many contexts now in which politicians emphasize the race-sensitive nature or the race-conscious nature of their politics, even when it actually benefits everybody. Uh, and that, I think, is, is both a rhetorical and a moral mistake. You say that humans are groupish, that as as you've just said, that they 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 tend to, to form in groups and out groups. But one question that I didn't find addressed in the book was how to deal with refugees. And I was in early March, I was on the Hungarian and Slovak borders with Ukraine, and there were all these Ukrainian refugees coming across. And the response from the Hungarians was truly exemplary. I mean, they welcomed these people in, they provided them with, with food and shelter and medicine and push chairs for those with children, uh, SIM cards for those who needed phones, free onward travel. They really took the Ukrainians to their heart, which of course is very different from the, the reception met by refugees from another part of the world um, in, in 2015 and, the, and even now. How can that be overcome? Because the Hungarians, you know, the, for them, the Ukrainians are their neighbours. So there is this, this kind of affinity. But Afghans, Syrians, Yemenis or whatever, they are from farther away. They have less in common with the Hungarians. Those Afghans are also fleeing a war. They are also um, entitled to be considered as, as refugees. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you deal with that? Well, I think I may be... Uh a little bit more cynical about what the reception of Ukrainians is going to look like in the coming months uh, than you are, which is to say that, uh, you know, yes, I think there's a real contrast in how Central European nations behave in 2015 and, and today. I'm not sure that there's such a contrast in how many Western European nations behave in 2015 and today. When I look at Germany, there was a huge wave of what was called Willkommenskultur, welcoming culture. In 2015, there was the scenes of people at the stations in many German cities welcoming, uh, cheering on refugees that had arrived from, from Syria and, and, and many other countries uh, at the time. Um, and then after a few months, after, uh, after half a year, after a year, suddenly the mood turned really sour. And, you know, at the moment, the horror of this war in Ukraine is very evident. Uh, there's a lot of solidarity uh, with Ukrainian refugees, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, you know, let's see whether or not that solidarity is still there in six or 12 months. I hope it will be, um, but but I fear that it may come to look more similar to the dynamics of 2015 or 2016 uh, than, is, than is now evident. I think more broadly on the topic of uh, uh, immigration, uh, there's a few points I want to make. First, this book is not a book about immigration in the sense that... Um, our societies are already deeply ethnically and religiously diverse. And whether or not we decide to uh, uh, have a lot more immigration in the next decades or have very little immigration in the next decades, the problems that I uh, deal with in the book and try to provide an answer for in the book will exist in any case. The second point about immigration is that I uh, you know, come from a family uh, of refugees. My grandparents were twice refugees. My parents were refugees. Um, and so I, I feel very strongly about, about uh, providing refuge to people in need. 
Um, on the broader topic of immigration, I think that we should recognize two things. The first is that democratic peoples do have a right to determine who enters the territory, and that it's perfectly legitimate to have political debates about what kind of immigration and what circumstances we want, how to balance uh, uh, economic and humanitarian needs, and so on. Um, and that actually, this is the third point, empirically I found there to be a strong correlation between people having a sense of control over the borders and being relatively generous. So for me as a Democrat, as a small d Democrat, I think we need to listen to our fellow citizens on the topic of immigration. We need to grant that this is uh, a decision to be made by democratic majorities. We need to show that we actually have control over who enters our territory. And then we need to make the case for why refugees fleeing wars are an urgent need of protection and why we have a responsibility to take them in. But this is, some, this is an argument that we have to win uh, uh, on a democratic basis. And that I think we can win on a democratic basis uh, if we demonstrate that we're actually willing to listen uh, to the preferences of, 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 of voters in our country. Again, in Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky seems to have been reimagining Ukrainian identity, trying to create a more diverse Ukrainian identity where it doesn't matter if you're a Russian speaker, you are still a Ukrainian. It doesn't matter if you're a Tatar or a Jewish Ukrainian, you are still a Ukrainian. Apart from anything else, seems to be the exact opposite way to how Russia is going. But if you were to advise a post-war Ukrainian government, okay, you want to you want to make a successful, diverse democracy, what what advice might you give? Where should they start? What are what are the pitfalls that they should avoid? Human nature is such that people will always have a strong sense of their group identity. They will always uh, strongly identify by their religion. Um, if there are salient ethnic uh, differences or differences of origin, differences of the language you speak, uh, that is always going to remain the case, and that's perfectly fine. That's that's great. Uh, one of the promises of our political system is that each individual can choose for themselves how to worship or not worship, who to associate with, um, what kind of groups to form. But precisely because that groupishness comes to us so easily and comes to us so naturally, we also need a set of principles and a set of institutions um, to make sure that we have something in common and that we can trust each other, that we retain basic freedoms. And so in the book, in The Great Experiment, I lay out the basic case for what uh, the philosophically liberal answer uh, to these questions is, uh, for what it means to ensure that each individual, each group is free from the tyranny of the majority, can remain uh, secure in the exercise of their religious preferences, for example, can remain secure in the exercise of no religion, if that's what they choose, um, but also make sure that individuals aren't subject to the control of their own community, to a cage of norms often imposed by their own elders uh, in a way that would be unacceptable. Uh, and one of the things I talk about is patriotism, which, as George Orwell pointed out, uh, is, is, is a value that the left needs to reclaim by rejecting ethnic nationalism by rejecting the idea that a true Britain or a true Ukrainian for that matter uh, has to have ancestors who've been there for 10 generations or have to belong to one particular ethno-linguistic group, focus more on civic values, focus more on the political aspirations we share. But, and this is an innovation in my book, I think, also on culture. And when I talk about culture, I don't mean traditional costumes and some imagined idea of what our culture was 300 years ago. It is the everyday breathing culture, the ever-changing culture, the culture that bears the mark of the people who are immigrants, who are minorities, uh, which actually make up modern democracies. And I think today we see in Ukraine that there is a culture uh, which Ukrainian speakers and Russian speakers actually share, that Ukraine has really become a nation in part because there is an everyday culture that its members share. And that is certainly uh, what I feel when I, when I come to the United Kingdom. Uh, that actually there is this really strong everyday culture, which includes people of very, very different groups. That is not about celebrating, uh, you know, Shakespeare and uh, Lord Acton, for I love Shakespeare and I love Lord Acton, but it is also about what London looks like today, what Birmingham looks like today, the culture, the music, the feel of the country, the way in which 
when you are in Britain and you've never left Britain, you might feel we don't have that much in common. The moment you step outside of Britain, you realize uh, that actually uh, to be British is a very meaningful category. And that's something that I think we should celebrate because it bears the influence, it bears the mark of the, the ways in which diversity has been relatively successful, does actually work in practice um, and can work even better in the future. Yasha Monk, thank you. The Great Experiment is published by Bloomsbury in the UK and by Penguin Press in the US. This has been the World Review from the New Statesman. You can read all our international coverage on newstatesman.com forward slash international. Oh.